Hello and welcome to another episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. Today we're very fortunate to have Dr. Tony Blazovich with us. Tony, thanks for being here. Um, do you want to give us an introduction of who you are and your background? Sure. Look, my name's Tony Blazovich. I'm a professor of biomechanics and lecturer oh, in clinical <laughs> neurophysiology. Let me start that again. Yeah. Introducing okay. Professor Tony Blazovich yeah. <laughs> from Edith Cowan University. It doesn't matter what you call me. It's not a problem. Tony, a whole bunch of other stuff has been used. Uh, yeah, so look, my name's Tony. I'm a professor of biomechanics and lecturer in clinical neurophysiology at Edith Cowan University. Um, I guess I majoritively spend my time doing research in the lab or in sporting uh, organisations. I have worked in elite sport, everything from Olympic gold medalists down to a lot of youth development work. Um, and most of the work I do nowadays is really taking injured athletes and finding ways to rehab them, although I sometimes work with other sporting teams just at the high performance aspects of it. Um, most of my research centers around how to make humans phenomenal at whatever physical tasks they're trying to do. So I basically use exercise as an engineering tool, trying to figure out how I can build the optimum human for different scenarios, whether that's clinical or in my case, majoritively uh, in sporting or daily life circumstances. It's interesting you brought it up from a, an engineering perspective. Do you, do you see it like that? Do you see it as an engineering problem? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, because I'm a, I've, I've moved more into biomechanics. I mean, don't get me wrong. When I was an undergrad, I thought that, you know, sports science is physiology, right? I mean, ESSA call their clinical people exercise physiologists, even though they are far more than that. We have this sort of belief system that physiology is the basis of all sports training. But as I got into my courses, um, even though I really didn't like maths and nearly failed maths at high school, I kind of figured if you don't know the forces, the torques, the velocities, the movement patterns, how am I ever going to actually train a human properly? And I was more into that speed strength side of things where you're really focusing on how to get the most maximal output out of a human system. And so as I then moved into the biomechanics through my research and sort of being forced to go into that realm and then teaching in biomechanics, it really opened my eyes to the understanding of the human as a sort of, I guess, a, a mechanical creature. And then comparing how humans move to how a bird flies or how a cheetah runs or how a kangaroo hops, then further sort of convinces you that once you understand the mechanical properties of the human, then you can build the right body. Now, that doesn't mean you don't use psychology, which is absolutely essential. I think I did six or eight psych units as an undergrad. I'm a big fan of sports psychology doesn't mean that all these other things, physiology, aren't important, but at the fundamental level, I can usually watch two athletes, an Olympic gold medalist and an Olympic silver medalist, and show you the differences in how they're moving and why one is more powerful or moving with greater economy than another. And, and, and unless you've got your movement patterns set, I don't think the rest of it is going to have a big influence under many circumstances. That probably brings two points, and I think we'll probably hopefully get to both. One is where do you see the bio part of biomechanics actually fitting in? Because if you do apply mechanical and engineering models, uh, it falls over really quickly, which I think is interesting in itself because I think it, it adds the added layer of the biological side of things. Um, and would be interested to get your idea on some of this stuff because particularly Jack more so than I um, has gotten very heavily into the anatomy uh, research that's going on in the area of fascia and myofascial systems and how that interplays I think is a really interesting part of what we see with that interaction from a mechanical point of view. Um, and the second part is looking at uh, that ob those observations that you are making, how we actually uh, start to integrate that into our practice so that we can make changes in that biomechanical realm. But if we go back to the first question, um, how do you see the integration of, you know, the, that bio, biological side of the biomechanical systems? Well, it's really, it's really, really important. And as you suggested, a lot of, when you just start talking about the mechanics, it can fall over quite quickly. And I'd argue that that's simply because we don't understand the system well enough, right? Like yeah. when, when everything Agreed. doesn't work, it just means that we're missing something. And, and that's why we're always learning and why whenever I, you know, meet people who say, ah, oh, I know how to do this, or they talk like they know everything straight away, I think, oh gosh, well, maybe I need to talk to you more because I've been doing this for 25, 30 years and I'm still, I feel like a baby. I, everything just doesn't make sense to me at the moment. 
So, so when I talk about the biological, a lot of my research is at the muscle nervous system tendon level. So I'm trying to understand how muscles actually function, how they work with their tendon to produce power, how that influences their energy cost and how the nervous system can then sort of work or, or activate muscles in a unique way to optimize that system. Obviously, it makes a lot of sense that if you've got you know, if we take a, a sprinter or a long distance runner, we see that on average their Achilles tendons relative to their limb lengths are very long. If you if you even look up in the knee, you'll see that above the patella, there's a lot of, you know, VL tendon in your distance runners and your, in your sprinters and jumpers. And then you go and get a weightlifter, you know, or a shot putter, and you'll see that the tendons are a lot shorter. There's The muscle goes all the way down to the knee. I mean, these are pretty simple things that you just see repeatedly. So there's something about the way we are built that matters. And of course, you already knew that because if we look at even bigger differences like a cheetah versus uh, a bear, you can see that they are completely different body builds and have different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, bear is never going to outrun a cheetah, but a cheetah is never going to be stronger than a bear. So what we're really interested in in the sporting realm is at, at what magnitude of difference can we still see some sort of performance difference? And can we select the right exercises, the right training tools to adapt those tissues in certain ways and within the realms or the limits of how much we can get tissues to adapt which is only very very small um, just one example as you grow your achilles tendon might become 500 percent stiffer but when we do lots of heavy weight training in someone who's never done it before it might get 30 to 70 percent stiffer so you're talking orders of magnitude you know less than just variability between people or with aging um, the question is are those are those exercise techniques that are targeting these tissues actually doing something meaningful? Now, if you practice high speed movement tasks, we learn to activate the muscle faster. We recruit units at a lower threshold, they have higher firing frequencies, particularly in those first 30, 35 milliseconds of firing, we get these really fast. We, we can see research has already shown how that then affects actin mice and interactions, affects the way tropomyosin moves, affects the way we develop force. So we know that if you practice moving fast, you get faster and we know exactly how that happens. So that's an example of how exercise can have a very meaningful difference in your output. Other questions, how much muscle size do you need? How much extra stiffening of a tendon might you want? Um, these are questions I don't think we always have the answers to, um, particularly in very specific situations. And so we're, we're kind of missing something. When you, when you talked about the fascia, that's really interesting. You know, we say fibre type masses. Well, at whole muscle levels, fiber type, as far as force production characteristics, is only a relatively minor player because your nervous system is so important, your muscle size is important. Muscles usually store and release elastic energy in tendons, that's really important. But even those muscle fibers have to transfer forces through their extracellular matrix. They're doing it while they're rotating as well as shortening. They're losing energy all the time. You're even transferring it between individual muscles. So. All of a sudden, what happens at a single fiber level doesn't really predict very well what's going to happen at the whole body level. So now we've even got this problem that even something that makes a big difference, like fast twitch versus slow twitch fiber, once you go to the whole human level, the question is, how much should we be targeting that? And is that really going to make the big difference at the end of the day? And again, that's individual specific, situation specific, and, and probably too big for a podcast. But I think these are examples where you can see that sometimes we think we can engineer a human to make them better and other times it's still, I guess, the jury's out as to whether certain adaptations are worth chasing. Well, it, on that point, actually, you know, an area of research I think that has, I guess, discussed a lot at the moment is looking at uh, muscle architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, I've seen you argue with people about this before, so it'd be yeah. interesting to get where you sit on this <laughs> yeah but well, about what what yeah what meaningful changes are happening and exactly because i know obviously the the current narrative is very strong around doing eccentric training to improve increase fascicle length and this has been associated with the function of the muscle and like say injury Shortening risk. velocities and things like that yeah. exactly but the question then comes when we think about looking at muscle physiology should we be thinking um well one is that relevant? Should we be thinking about, do we need to apply certain interventions to create a certain type of muscle architecture profile? Or do you think we need to actually think more at the biomechanical level of what are the actual mechanical stresses that this person or individual needs to uh, perform or be able to experience in order to complete a sport or task? 
So the answer is two, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to your point one about muscle architecture. So I have a bias, right? And my bias was that back in the 1990s, I don't know how old you were then, but I, I assume you were born in the 1990s. Back in the primary You were alive at the start. Back in the <laughs> 1990s, I was doing a lot of reading on muscle architecture. You know, Oaten and others had published papers in the 80s, and there was others from the 70s um, that had made it very, very clear to me based on my reading that the functional characteristics of a muscle are most strongly affected by its architectural design. Um, there's a really nice uh, Tom Burkholder paper with Rick Lieber in 1992 and 1994, and they kind of find the same thing. Even when you compare fiber types and everything else, the if you stimulate muscles in from animals and look at their vo uh, force, velocity, length properties, they are most strongly affected by the architecture of the muscle. So as a young researcher, then I realized that if we could use exercise to alter the design of a muscle, I should be able to revolutionize training, right? I'm going to become mm. some sort of godlike figure in sports sciences because I can tell you exactly how to train to change your muscle to make it faster, stronger, work through a greater range of motion or whatever I want to do. And, and I set out to try and do exactly that. I have to say that 25 years later, I have failed in that attempt and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not confident that we've done that at all. So my first attempts were just to change architecture and at least based on the slightly dodgy ultrasound methods we had back then, it looked like we could do it. And one of the big things is fiber length, because if you can add sarcomeres in series, you broaden the force length relationship, you increase the peak shortening speed, you therefore shift the peak power to higher speeds, all these awesome things that someone who's interested in sprint running would want to do. And of course, there was some evidence that sprinters have longer fascicles if you measure them with an ultrasound at rest in one or two muscles. So it all made sense to me. So then you go to the literature and you say, well, how might training influence it? Now, let's be really clear here. From the 60s and earlier, researchers had already done studies where they, for example, if you take the TA, the tibialis anterior muscle at the front of the shin, and you cut the retinaculum that holds it close to the shin, so it pops away, and that increases its moment arm, but it also tends to shorten the muscle a little bit because the, the tendon has been released. They call this a retinaculum release. You do it in mice, you can do it in rabbits. And when you do that, the muscle sits short, which means every time the mice runs or the rabbit hops, it has to work through a larger length range now because it's got a big moment arm. So yeah. you need a big length change to move the joint. And it has to work at a faster speed. And even its average length is longer. And when you do that, even in the 60s, we knew that the muscle grew longer. And it shifted the force length relationship to longer lengths. It broadened it out. These sorts of adaptations are exactly what we expect to see if you add sarcomeres in series. So two decades later, Rick Lieber, Walter Herzog, and these guys all started to actually measure in vivo using sort of laser diffraction techniques or taking them out and looking under microscopes, taking fibers out and looking under microscopes. Are there any, is there any evidence for addition of sarcomeres? And under that retinaculum release methodology, absolutely, absolutely sarcomeres increase. And this fits with the long held traditional belief that the excursion range of the muscle, the magnitude of strain under which it goes is the primary determinant of the number of sarcomeres. It could also be, and some of the data hints that just it's normal operating length. So if you're always at a long length, maybe that's a secondary signal as well. And that's why when we grow and everything else, we add sarcomeres in series. Interestingly, around the 1990s, there was an, an idea of this popping sarcomere hypothesis by David Morgan's group. You've probably heard of that. It's debunked now, largely by Walter Herzog's um, data. <clears throat> but as part of that popping sarcomere hypothesis, the idea was, wow, if you stretch a muscle too much, you're getting all this muscle damage and muscle injury. So if we do eccentric training, that could easily just add extra sarcomeres in series. And then they don't have to lengthen as far onto that descending limb. And then they should be saved. So they ran some rats uphill and downhill. They didn't know what the muscle was actually doing. They just had noticed that in the 1960s, another research group found that if rats ran downhill, they got sore muscles. And we all know that eccentric training causes soreness. So they figured, well, downhill must be eccentric and uphill is clearly concentric. So they published two papers and found that the downhill rats added sarcomeres and the uphill lost sarcomeres job done. And I believed it too, by the way, at that time. Hence why I did a study in the early 2000s looking at concentric versus eccentric training in humans. 
there were lots of problems though. One, why didn't they measure vastus lateralis? I mean, that's a much easier muscle in a rat to get to, just like it is in a human. Why only publish the vastus intermedius? That's a really weird muscle. You have to scrape it off the bone. It's hard to study. Second of all, we don't actually know that the muscles lengthened in the downhill group. As you know, there are lots of times in human, in, in animal world where the whole muscle tendon unit lengthens, but the muscle actually shortens. Every mm. time you run, your foot lands on your ground, your calf muscles shorten, not lengthen. Third of all, there are, it was already quite well known that the, the strain of the fiber was the key determinant. So what if just running downhill had different length characteristics? None of that was known, right? Yet, in the same decade, in that late 90s, a number of research groups had continued to look at the idea of strain, including during eccentric contractions. So one of Walter Herzog's group members did a really nice study doing eccentric exercise, right, and found that it could either increase the number of sarcomeres, decrease the number of sarcomeres, or have no effect, depending which muscle and in which area. I mean, these were muscles where you knew they'd done eccentric contractions. And the idea was because the strain, even in those eccentric contractions, varies across the muscle, mm. that's what actually dictates sarcomere number. So where are we today? Well, today, the majority of evidence from the animal data indicates that it's the strain or the average length that is the primary determinant of sarcomere number. And there is no conclusive evidence that eccentric is a unique stimulus in animals because it can even decrease the number of sarcomeres quite easily. And yet concentric exercise and isometric exercise and even passive stretch can increase them too. But in humans, of course, we took this ultrasound and said, oh, look, we can measure fascicle lengths. And surely fascicle length is somewhat representative of sarcomere length. And you'd be kind of right. I did the same thing, by the way. So there's my bias. The problem is, Muscles considered all different lengths. You put a little bit of extra tension on the end of it, it rests a little bit longer. If you have another muscle that pushes up into it, it rests a little bit longer. If, if you've just done lots of long muscle length stuff, it doesn't just contract back to its normal length, it rests a little bit longer. So lots of reasons why it might do that. And in fact, Jan Frieden in 1983 published a really nice paper showing that eccentric exercise was causing new sarcomeres to form by the way, I didn't see add sarcomeres because he has no idea what happened to the number of sarcomeres. It's just that he could see sarcomeres being added. But as you know, when we damage, we also take them away. So the question is, did you add more than you took away? We don't know. But what you also see is a deregistration of all the um, myofibrils within the, my my within the fiber. And so what that shows us is that when we're straining muscles, you get this shear force. And we now know that muscle soreness from DOMS. We know that acute muscle injury is largely at the connective tissue level, even at the extracellular matrix. And the repeat bout effect seems to have a lot to do with how the extracellular matrix adapts so rapidly. In other words, it's not really what's happening with the number of sarcomeres. It's what's happening to this strain or shear. And even in his paper, you can see that they're deregistered. And what that would normally do is you'd expect that to make the fiber sit longer because you've deregistered them. So there's lots of evidence for decades that indicated to us that a fiber can, a fascicle could look longer or shorter just based on its recent activity history that has nothing to do with sarcomere addition. But the data are even more important than that because the one thing I was always looking for is whether the change in architecture that I was evoking affected its function. And in one paper, in a JAP paper in 2007, I found some really nice over time temporal associations with the force length relationship. So I published it and thought, you beauty, aren't I awesome? But I've never been able to redo that study. I've never been able to validate that finding in any other model. We do isometric training. We shift the length tension relationship in lots of ways. And it never, ever is associated with changes in resting fascicle length measured by ultrasound. And almost all of the studies you've ever read, I bet you don't find these sorts of specific tests either because we don't do them. We just assume what it means and we don't check that we're right. And in fact, Glenn Lichfark's group um, did a really nice study recently showing that fascicles that looked about 20% longer didn't have more sarcomeres in series. It's just that those sarcomeres rested at a longer length. He's now doing a study, I think, over nine weeks. I look forward to seeing what happens there. But a final thing you might want to consider is this. When you're doing, say, uh, eccentric hamstring curls, you know, you're doing your Nordics, don't get me wrong, I think that they really could be useful for injury prevention for completely different mechanisms. But you're seeing this 20% lengthening of the fascicle in just three weeks. Have you ever thought about what that would mean if that was sarcomere addition? That's a lot imagine, of muscle. 
imagine growing your muscles by 20% in three weeks. Mm. I mean, if you're a python, that's feasible. Even if you're a rat, <laughs> that's feasible. Yeah. All right. If you're a human, that is not feasible. And in fact, I think it was about 2007, someone did do laser diffraction to look at sarcomere addition using laser diffraction in um, for, um, sorry, for limb distension surgery. That's where you break the bone of someone and basically keep pulling it every week longer and longer. And of course, the muscle has to grow, right? It has to grow. That's known to be an awful thing. A lot of fibrosis in the tissue it really stresses your muscles to the absolute limits. And if you go back to those sorts of papers on limb distension, the muscles are growing at around about that sort of 20% over a couple of weeks kind of rate, which is awful for the muscle. So do you really think that a couple of sets of hammies are doing that much trauma to your muscles? And I don't think that's the case at all. So it doesn't mean that exercise, and it doesn't even mean that eccentric exercise cannot add sarcomeres in series. What I'm saying is that eccentric training may not be a unique stimulus for it, and if we are getting these adaptations in humans, it's likely that it's taking a high volume of exercise over a long period of time, probably months or years. For example, in a rectus femoris of a sprint runner, which works through very large strains, versus a cyclist, which works over very small strains, you do get very big differences in force length properties, which are probably associated with sarcomere number differences. Right? So it can happen. Just don't think that three weeks of Nordics are going to do it for you. Yeah, I think of, uh, I can't think of the authors of the study, but a study of looking at uh, resting muscle architecture pre and post stretching and seeing that acute change. And obviously it's not got to do with changes in sarcomeres and series, but changes of say the compartment shape and how that creates that potential illusion of the fascicle being longer. But it's interesting actually, you, know, you talk about uh, say hamstring eccentric loading, particularly with Nordics. I know this is something that John and I have spoken about of just the actual nature of Nordic hamstring exercises being very difficult. And in fact, the, the mechanical load that you're putting through it is typically of a, a large magnitude that for people who haven't done them before are very unfamiliar with. And even just that concept of getting someone to do an exercise that they simply cannot do and applying enough mechanical stress to create certain changes into the neuromuscular system and how that may be beneficial from an injury prevention perspective. So this is a, another really interesting one. I just presented ECSS on a topic, the European College of Sports Science, on, on, on this. because, And this is the reason why we're now trying to do all these dynamic measurements using several ultrasounds along a muscle and trying to figure out what the fascicles are actually doing, what the fibres are actually doing. So Baz van Huren did a study, just recently published a study in Scandinavian Journal of Medicine, Science and Sport, showing that during the Nordic and I think during the Roman there was the, the fascicles basically remained isometric for the majority of it. So if we just stick to the um, Nordic, remember, as you fall, here's your biomechanics, right? Your body mass moves further from the point of rotation. So the moment arm increases. What that means is, of course, your knee flexion load increases as you fall. That means the muscle force goes up. And of course, mm -hmm. you guys should know that when the muscle force goes up, the tendons get stretched. Now, it's really hard to look at fascicle length in these muscles, but you kind of can understand why in that study, Baz found that in the first part of the fall, as the force started to rise, the fibers themselves actually shortened a bit. Then they tended to stay isometric. And you know, that very last bit where you just fall at the bottom and EMG goes down and you just fall, that's when the fibers lengthen. In other words, it wasn't an eccentric exercise at all. If you're doing a very heavy, heavily loaded for you relative to your strength, Nordic, the majority of this is not eccentric for your hamstrings. It's eccentric, it's, it's lengthening the series elastic component, but it's probably not actually an eccentric action, right? Mm -hmm. We can come back and talk about the same thing with flywheel exercise, right? What's actually happening there is you are loading it at a relatively long muscle length or just giving it a big isometric stress. Now, that means that either it's the isometric heavy stress that's actually giving us whatever adaptations we think are beneficial, or it's that last little bit right at the end where the fibers actually lengthen. And in fact, even in one of Walter Herzog's studies in, I think it was in rats, no, it might've been in mice muscle, they found that the addition of sarcomeres, which did happen in some of the muscles, was more related to the amount of stretch after the muscle was deactivated, because they activate it and then deactivate it during the eccentric. And once you deactivate the muscle, 
the series elastic component therefore shortens because it hasn't got a force on it, and that pulls the muscle longer. And they actually found a really nice correlation that once you deactivated muscle, the amount of lengthening of fiber was more so actually it might have been more associated with the damage in that study, not not sarcomere number. And same with the Nordics, it's the lengthening is occurring when you deactivate it. So is it the deactivation lengthening that's doing the job? And if that's the case, maybe the point of having extra load is that you simply get a bigger magnitude of unloading, causing a bigger magnitude of fascicle lengthening. Remembering that if you want to look at the amount of damage in a muscle, lots of research shows that, again, it's the amount of strain far more important than the amount of force that affects the damage response. So if you want to get DOMS, you have to stretch the actual fiber, it, it, whether it's a low force or a high force. And what we're finding, of course, is that in some of these exercises, it's the low force eccentric contractions that actually allow the fiber to lengthen. If that's the case, you could argue from a mechanism point of view that we should actually be doing light eccentrics, not heavy eccentrics. That sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? <laughs> so what is the actual mechanism? Based on everything we know, heavy Nordics shouldn't be doing any kind of true eccentric work. If they're lengthening the fascicles, why is it doing so? Is it the deactivation lengthening or is it simply that you have got so much tension in the muscle that it's lengthening, tighten, or it's causing a deregistration? And these things might be correlated with injury incidents and performance, not the number of sarcomeres. The number of sarcomeres might have absolutely nothing to do with what's going on. One thing you mentioned then was dynamic muscle architecture. And as opposed to, say, static muscle architecture, is there much research or, you know, are you, are you thinking that the behavior of the muscle tendon unit dynamically is much more relevant in terms of understanding performance of the muscle tendon unit or even from an injury perspective as opposed to just looking at it in a static isolated position? Yeah, I think so. And that, and that comes from, but, but I could be wrong. Right? So, and mm. that comes from the fact that for 20 years, I've been trying to figure out how we can change the architecture of a muscle and, in, and alter its function in a predictable and meaningful way. And I just don't believe we've been able to do that very well. I mean, if you practice eccentric contractions, you get stronger eccentrically, but I'm, I'm not saying that that's because of the architectural, that could be a lot to do with the neurological, that could be to do with your fascias, your extracellular matrix adaptations. There's lots of reasons why it could be effective. So then the question then is, well, we do know that architecture varies massively between muscles. What, what, what varies within muscles or over time with training, though, is things like how much water a cell has. You know, you do strength training, massive increase in intracellular water. If you do eccentrics or any kind of strength training, we get a massive change in the extracellular matrix. Muscle function is affected by aging, you know, and we know that intracellular water and extracellular matrix are strongly affected by aging. This idea that we lose power with aging just because our fiber type might change it seems really hollow given that the effect of fiber type on whole body power is only modest. And the fact that it's only one adaptation out of all the things that can change in the uh, aging human. So you start to think, well, what else could it be? And then, of course, you know, animal studies and some other studies, particularly in the last 10 to 20 years, have shown that, of course, fibers rotate. We always knew that. They rotate as they shorten. That's been shown for 100 years. Um, but that as you change the load, the muscle changes how its shape changes. And that changes how much the fibers shorten versus rotate. And of course, if you have a very light load, the muscle fibers can easily rotate. And that, that extra rotation adds shortening distance and adds shortening velocity. In other words, it increases the power at a given load. So could this rotation be the key? Well, your initial pronation angle is a big driver of the amount of rotation and the effect of rotation. Because if I rotate from here to here, the muscle hasn't shortened much, right? But if I rotate from here to here, the muscle has shortened quite a lot. So the more steep your initial pronation, the same fiber change, same angle change, the same rotation will have a bigger shortening effect, a bigger velocity effect. Is this one reason, for example, why heavy weight training is good for what we call power athletes? You know, maybe this is because the increase in pination then allows more rotation, shifting the power velocity curve to faster velocities. 
Is it that the loss of pination and the change in extracellular matrix and the loss of intracellular or just whole, whole muscle water is affecting how the fibers are then rotating and therefore how much shortening they have to undergo? And even in one study, there was some study done where they lengthened the muscle and showed that the rotation of the fiber downwards reduced massively the amount of actual fiber strain which of course we expect to minimize damage and potentially injury, which is again why I always thought it was interesting. Oh, we do Nordics and we lose pination angle. Of course, that seems to be the only muscle where that seems to happen. Strength training increases pination. And if we lose pination, they can't rotate. That means your fascicles have to do all the work. So even if we were adding sarcomeres in series, there's still a big problem. You need them because the fast fibers are going to have to stretch more. That can't be a good thing. So this idea that Altering extracellular matrix, water, initial pination angles and other things might then dynamically affect how the muscle functions is, is really kind of functionally useful, relevant and a really nice framework within which to look. And we're now doing studies looking at the effects of fatigue. We've started studies look, comparing young and old. We're about to start a study looking at concentric versus eccentric training to see whether eccentric training, because of its alterations in extracellular matrix and tendon stiffness, might have different evoke different adaptations as far as how the muscle then works dynamically and of course what we'd love to show is whether the static architecture is related to dynamic as far as pination angle it very well could be but again remember if you've got two muscles beside each other pushing on each other that very strongly affects how they they work dynamically regardless of what they look like at rest it's when all of those things are pushing and, and everything else and how they then can perform dynamically that really matters. And so that's, I guess, where we're moving now. You have a question, Joe? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> One question I wanted to ask when you're talking about um, things that influence muscle architecture, and you're talking about the uh, lengthening at the, at the very end and the deactivation. What... Does something like stretching then potentially change muscle architecture if it's of an appropriate magnitude, particularly if it's more passive so that you're essentially trying to lengthen the muscle? I don't know. I mean, to the best of our current understanding, passive stretching doesn't lengthen your muscle. It, 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 it seems to affect the parallel elastic components. So those extracellular matrix that goes around your fibers and around your fascicles and even around the whole muscle. And they tend to become more compliant when measured under passive stretch conditions. And I want to be really clear that that's measuring it passively mm. because some really nice research in the last sort of 10 years or so is, is really showing us that you've got the amount of collagen in your extracellular matrix, you've got certain rod-like sort of structures in your extracellular matrix, and you've got cross-linking and wavy-like patterns in your extracellular matrix. And they all seem to be affecting passive versus active function differently. So passive stretch seems to make the extracellular matrix and these parallel elastic components more compliant under passive conditions. I don't know exactly what th that's doing during dynamic. I, I don't know if it's affecting the crimp-like patterns, the wavy patterns, the rod-like formations. I, I, don't, I don't know. And remember, when we do passive stretching studies, we then tend to measure passive flexibility, which is not active flexibility. And... Um, a, a few studies have looked at, you know, passive stiffness and active stiffness and shown that they're very different properties. Um, mm. Matthias Pinto just did a really nice study in Scandinavian Journal of Medicine, Science and Sport where he did dorsiflexions to look at the plantar flexors and showed if you get people to activate their muscle and hold a certain joint torque, some people, are, they're not only stiffer because they're active, some people are far more flexible under the active condition than the passive condition, you know, mm. and the people who were more flexible in the relaxed condition weren't necessarily the most flexible in the active and vice versa. So for some reason, people even differ in their own maximum ranges of motion under these conditions. So yeah, well, we've got a real problem say. around understanding dynamic muscle function by doing all this passive stuff, right? And then I'm to blame mm. for part of that, because as you know, I've done a lot of passive stretching studies in my time as well. Well, it's also brings back to that point of mechanics versus biomechanics because you see that nonlinear response where the relationship between passive and active stiffness is actually not that correlated. And I often think about doing, say, eccentric training where you get an improvement in active stiffness, but you see a reduction in passive stiffness. So you see that yes. decoupling effect where, um, you know, I always think about that when you think of, say, correlations between distance runners and passive stiffness and thinking that, 
passive stiffness is good. It makes you more economical. Yet when you get them to do stretching and you see an improvement in passive stiffness, it doesn't necessarily cause a reduction in their running economy. And it's no. important to make that differentiation. So I think that's a really, really good example of how little we know and, and how dangerous it is at the moment to think you know what you're doing when you're doing exercise. You know, we know that <laughs> distance runners who have, have poor flexibility are often the most economical distance runners. Mm. So what does that mean? Oh, when we do a passive stretch test, yeah. But what about when the plantar flexors are actually active and storing elastic energy? Oh, but stiffer is better. Actually, at the tendon level, that does seem to be the case for the Achilles tendon for economical mm. distance running. And we've got data, by the way, that we haven't published from back in the olden days with the UK uh, athletes. So I can verify that we can validate and, and, and replicate those sorts of findings. Um, but you're right. Um, you give a static stretching and it neither improves nor reduces them. You'd expect it to reduce their running economy, right? But three months of it didn't seem to do a damn thing. Now, that doesn't mean that too much of it isn't going to be bad. It just means that it just doesn't mean that if you stretch enough to make them more passively flexible, you're going to reduce performance, right? But then there might be other things. So when, like you said, when we do eccentric training, we think, oh, that makes us stiffer. That's good. But actually it improves range of motion quite remarkably while you're getting a stiffer tendon and while your muscle voluntarily is able to resist tension better in other words active stiffness is improved so hang on if your tendon is stiffer and your active muscle is stiffer yet you're passively more extensible what does that mean and, and as i said it probably comes down to things like at the whole muscle level the resistance to a whole muscle stretch as long as you don't have other factors like the joint itself or whatever affecting you is primarily affected by the stiffness, the passive stiffness of that parallel elastic component. And the factors that influence its stiffness and its force transmission under a passive relaxed stretch seem to be different to those under active conditions. So now we really don't know what's going on, but we do know that generally adding some eccentric seems to do some pretty cool things. That's what we know. Mm. We should probably open the can of worms, and that is of stretching and some of the uh, controversy around stretching, because there seems to be a very, very strong narrative at the moment that stretching doesn't have any uh, value in a, say, performance or a rehabilitation setting. And I think it's probably worth actually exploring, like, why do you think that narrative is so strong? Because I know you've obviously done a lot of work yourself also with um, David Bam and, and uh, Anthony Kay of looking into this area. So... I'm interested to see, like, why do you think we see this strong narrative against stretching and, and do you think that's correct or do you think we need to be a bit more nuanced about how we look at the literature? Um, so, so first of all, if you just read lots of literature and you're not reflecting on the experimental designs in a really fundamental way, it does look like passive stretching is not reducing injury rates the way we were always told. So it's like we were lied to. Oh, that's bad. You know, you know what people are like when all of a sudden they feel like they've been lied to. They really get on, get passionate about it, don't they? It's like nutrition. Mm. Everyone's passionate about that. They all know everything about it. Um, and then, you know, people said, oh, you should do stretching as you warm up so you perform better. And not only that, not only did they not perform better, but it turned out that lots of studies show that if you do all this stretching stuff, you get worse. So, uh, you know, if you want a, a tabloid headline, it's the stretching is clearly not doing everything it was sold to do. And then you go back to the historical research and find out we never really had the scientific evidence in the first place that it was doing what we said it was going to do. It is a problem, though, because what it means is that then people completely flip, like the world is black and white rather than grey, and they haven't really gone and looked at the study designs to determine under which circumstances or under which um, programming designs these are relevant and useful to you in practice. And unfortunately, the majority of these studies are relatively useless for the majority of us. And so we shouldn't be worrying about them. So I just want to take you back. Remember, from in, the, in, in World War II, when you, you're training North American soldiers, they used to do these sort of active warm-ups, you know, it made heaps of sense. So all of a sudden after World War II, when North America, that's Canada and, and the USA, by the way, wanted to make sure that they were fit for the next war, you know, all the, the kids in school and particularly all the boys had to go into all this gym to keep them fit and ready for whatever came at them. And that involved all the same military stuff that they'd done during the war. The problem is a lot of clinicians, a lot of people working with these people said, look, I think these dynamic stretches, all these, you know, leg swings and all that during warm up, I think they're causing some soft tissue injuries here. We're, we're pretty nervous about it. Now, don't get me wrong. 
there wasn't proper research done. But you're getting all these clinicians saying, hey, I think there's a big problem here. And it makes sense because if you stretch a muscle too fast, you get this reflex, it activates the muscle. So it's resisting stretch when you're trying to stretch it. No wonder it gets injured. Hey, let's all do static or relaxed or passive stretching because then the muscle will stretch further. We get better range of motion benefits. You're not activating the muscle while you're stretching it, which should cause damage and injury. Look, that all made heaps of sense, right? So then we all transitioned to static stretching. The problem was no one had checked whether static stretching was reducing injury and no one had really checked whether it had reduced force. I mean, back in the 90s when I was doing lots of bench presses in the gym as a teenager, we knew that if we wanted to break the 100 kilo mark, we had to warm up properly. So we started stretching more and more and more and noticed that we went further and further from our 100 kilo mark. People in the gym had already figured out that too much stretching was causing a problem. And it took until the early 2000s for some really well-designed research to show that static or passive stretching, if done for long durations, absolutely can reduce muscle force production, particularly maximal muscle force. That changed everything. All of a sudden, people started to say, well, let's just get people to do a test, do static or passive versus dynamic and ballistic stretching and compare the two. By the way, that's the study design. Literally, don't do much either just passive or, or dynamic stretching, lo and behold, dynamic stretching is better. Oh, no kidding, because if you're up there doing highly warming, dynamic, motivating activities, you perform better immediately after it than if you sat down on the ground, got nice and cold and did static stretches and relaxed. I don't think it required a couple of hundred studies to prove that that was going <laughs> to be the case. Why but, do you think there were hundreds of studies? That's the thing that gets me too. Because it's sexy. <laughs> Once you show something that looks really, then you say, well, does this happen in soccer players? Does this happen in basketball players? Does it happen in the youth? Does it happen in the elderly? Does it happen in, mm. I don't know. Look, in the end, that tells us something though, right? It, it tells us that if you're just about to do something that requires high muscle force or even high power, don't do very long static stretches and nothing else before you do it. Great. But that's not what we do in most sports. It's not what we do at the gym anyway. So in that context, it's not useful to us, but it still tells us something. I'm going to try and shorten the story now because otherwise it gets too long. When we review all the literature, it is true that there is no evidence at all that, that prolonged static stretches reduce all-cause injury risk. So if you think it's going to reduce overtraining syndromes and tibial stress fractures and everything else, you're, you're mistaken as far as we can tell. If you look at the studies that have specifically focused on muscle, muscle tendon or muscle tendon ligament injuries like ankle sprain, where there has been a warm up done in an athletic population and then they've added static stretching, there is, I would argue that there is small or potentially a moderate injury minimization effect of adding static stretching. It's not great, but it's there. And even in studies in the military that do all cause injury, if you go and look at specific injuries, for example, you'll see a reduction in muscle strain injury. Like, 50% reduction in injuries or more. Just that they didn't go to that statistical detail because overall there wasn't a change in muscle tendon injury. So they didn't then go and look, for example, at thigh injury or calf injury. So that I think, you know, based on all the reading I've done, I would advocate that static or passive stretching can play a role in running based sports for muscle tendon, soft tissue type injuries. And therefore, over a 10 year period, you might reduce your risk of, you might have one or two less injuries over that 10 years if you had been doing all your static stretching. Dynamic stretching. I've actually seen a group of people come together and publish a paper advocating that in an injury prevention warm up, you should be doing dynamic stretching. Let's be really clear there's only one paper so far that I've ever found that has any evidence for dynamic stretching. And it simply said back in 1983 by, I think it was Chris Trippadal, that in soccer teams that had the lowest number of hamstring injuries, they had done some form of stretching in their warm up, usually briefly and of a dynamic nature. <laughs> That's your evidence. Hey, by the way, let's just remind ourselves. Now, I, again, I'll show you my bias. My bias is in myself as an athlete and in other athletes, I use dynamic stretching, right? I do use it for lots of different reasons. But let's be honest. If, if, a, if a doctor found 
without an RCT, without a randomized controlled trial, if doctors started saying, hey, we're really nervous about this drug that people are using, and they said, right, until we got proof, let's get rid of the drug. And 40 years later, people started to say, hey, that new drug that everyone thought was better, I don't think it's actually good. So let's go back to the old drug, even though people thought that it was bad, and we've never had any evidence as to whether it's good. But we're going to go back to it because we think dynamic stretching is awesome and you should put it in an injury prevention warm-up. Well, number one, there's no evidence for it. Number two, we thought it was bad. And that's why we got rid of it. Now, don't get me wrong. The evidence that it was bad isn't good either. <laughs> but would you, would you honestly give someone a drug that was removed from sale because it was bad in the eyes of clinicians and replace it with something that we know is not bad from an injury perspective? Although remember, force output is improved at long muscle lengths. And and add it and add this thing back in without actually going back to double check that it's safe or even beneficial. I, I wouldn't do it. And if I had athletes getting injured, if we were in the medicine field, you could expect a whole bunch of litigation. <laughs> so I wouldn't be advocating strongly for dynamic stretching either from a performance point of view, unless you can't do a warm up. Like if right now I asked you to do a vertical jump and I gave you 20 seconds to prepare do some dynamic leg swings and a few practice jumps, right? You, you wouldn't be static stretching. But, but outside that, I think we need to really think about what evidence we have. And, and that is that maybe static or passive stretching might, under some circumstances, reduce injury. We've seen no evidence of it increasing injuries. Oh, by the way, in runners, a pragmatic trial in thousands of runners, again, reduced injury rates and reduced perceived soreness and that includes joint soreness as well as muscle soreness so even in just straight distance runners by a small margin they're saying that their bodies are recovering better and handling the loading better if they added passive static stretching into their warm-ups so that was a massive trial um, done um, by one of the same groups that that argued that static stretch wasn't doing anything so there's no bias there so at the moment, I'm an advocate for passive static stretching done in very small amounts because it allows you to check whether you're sore, check whether you're tight or stiff. It may possibly reduce injury risk. And psychologically, we believe it's improving. Well, we have randomized controlled data to show that if you add any type of stretching, dynamic or passive, it increases your perception of readiness for your sport. So in, in my opinion, go for it. But if you're really worried about it, don't stretch long. We can get into the mechanisms. Stretching long is still really bad, right? Don't, don't, don't overstretch. Do you, would you make the caveat there with um, stretching really long as a part of your warm up? Do you think there's a role for doing more prolonged stretching as a separate training session to, to work on improving, say, baseline flexibility or even maybe from like a recovery perspective? Yes, I do. Um, it's hard to know from a recovery perspective. What it can do from a recovery perspective is, A, it again allows you to check. Have I got soreness? Have I got tightness? Have I got tension? And then you can tell your medical team about it. The second thing that static stretching does remarkably well is reduces sympathetic drive. This is why it's good for your vascular health, for example. This is why it's good for depression and anxiety. And this, we believe, is the mechanism that actually underpins your loss of force, that the lowered sympathetic drive then affects a, an amplifier system in your spinal cord, and that causes the problem with the loss of force. Mm. But if you're a competitive athlete, you've just done a highly stressful game, of course, therefore, reducing sympathetic drive is actually probably a very good thing for you. In that case, there are, again, I'd say, positives to post-exercise and post-competition stretching. It's also the case that just static stretching does improve flexibility, although how it improves dynamic mobility is a different question that I don't think we've got the right answers for. Um, when it comes for just doing long stretching to get more flexibility, absolutely, stretching training works. Now, what you probably also know is that doing strength training through a large range of motion or at long muscle lengths also works. Uh, eccentric training works, even if you don't go through a large range of motion. If you do, if you activate your muscle and push it, it's even more effective, possibly two to three times more effective than static stretching for improving maximum range of motion at a joint. If you stretch and then activate it, at least acutely, we become more flexible. Or, as we've shown, as Tony Kay showed, if you stretch and take it off stretch and do the isometric contraction, you also get far more flexible. Yeah. So that works. So you can do lots of things to get more flexible. 
So why do static stretching? Well, you can do static stretching because it has all those other benefits of lowered sympathetic drive. You can do it as a team right now on the floor. You don't need special equipment. Um, you can do it at home and you can do every single joint muscle group through every perceivable angle and thing to find out where am I tight? Um, where might I be sore? And if you just do a couple of eccentric or strength training exercises, you, you're not going to pick up on that. So whilst you don't need to do static stretching, and there may even be better ways to get more flexible, I would just simply argue that static stretching is a useful way that can be done anywhere through any range of motion at any joint without any help at all. And therefore, it's really, really good. And by the way, athletes love to have self-efficacy, self-control. And stretching is something that they can be doing by themselves even on their easy weeks, even when they're injured, and it gives them that self sense of self-control. So for that reason, it can be useful too. You know, you talked about the impact of stretching on, say, your autonomic nervous system. I know you've done a paper with, um, is it Craig Gabriel Trajano? Is that how you pronounce yes. Yep. Last name? Yeah, yeah. Trajano. Yep. I'm looking how it impacts things like your persistent inward currents. Just from a, a, a clinical observation, one thing I've noticed with giving certain athletes prolonged stretching is it can have a prolonged effect on their autonomic output where they almost get that sort of depressed sympathetic uh, response for like a long time. They might have stretched the night before but then actually feel quite fatigued for a couple of days. Is that something that you've observed yourself? And is that and do you sort of have, if so, any kind of rationale for why some people might have that prolonged almost dampening of their nervous system? Um, you've asked two questions and the answer is a yes and no. Um, <laughs> yes, I have seen it. Yes, I believe you're on the right track. Mm. No, I haven't done any research in it. And for about 10, 10 to 12 years, it's been right at the top of my to-do list, but I just haven't had either the funding or a student willing to do it. So if any of your listeners have <laughs> a group of sprinters or a group of high-performing athletes or, you know, just regularly training athletes, so here's, what, here's something that we've noticed anecdotally. So this is something that you observe in practice. Now, just be clear here, I'm a scientist and I love scientific data informing everything, as you can probably tell, right? Because it also not only tells us new things, but it stops us making dumb mistakes by overthinking everything. But that doesn't mean that we lead the world with research. What usually happens, of course, majority of the time is that we see something in practice and then study it in the lab to understand it. And something that we've noticed in practice and this has been known for decades, is that if you do have athletes who do a lot of static stretching, actually their top running speeds can sometimes come down a bit and sometimes even their maximal strength can come down a bit. It makes sense from the point of view that we also know that static stretching can have prolonged effects on uh, mental health and prolonged effects on arterial health as far as measuring the vasodilation response of arteries, which is also strongly driven by sympathetic parasympathetic um, uh, ratio, right? Um, so if that's the case, then it makes sense that the decrease in neural drive, decrease in the spinal cord amplifier, the, the persistent inward currents, instead of only being switched off for about five to 10 minutes, which is what seems to happen mostly after an acute, you know, couple of minutes of stretching, if you now stretch twice a day for a couple of weeks, we do, the, the possibility exists that it might do a, a prolonged dampening of that response. I've never studied it. I really, really, really want to do that study. And I want to do it both from a mechanism point of view, persistent inward currents, maybe um, uh, pupil dilation, a few things like to look at the noradrenergic drive. And from a practical point of view, I, I've always wanted to have a study where we can get athletes in training weekly where they're getting running speeds and force platform data weekly and then alternate over several weeks whether they do lots of static stretching or not lots of static stretching and look for these more prolonged periods. And there's no doubt that track and field coaches have noticed that if they give their athletes too much static stretching, their 100 meter runners aren't hitting PBs. They have to really reduce the amount of stretch. And in fact, in, a, in some other things that I've done, I've, I've often talked about periodization of stretching, that in your off-season and early pre-season, you might do a lot more of it to free the body up. It allows you to practice motor patterns that you're trying to achieve without being too stiff. It just alleviates a lot of your tightness, which can potentially, we don't know, but potentially increase uh, arthritis risk and stuff with age, in, in, in aging. But then as you approach the competitive season, you probably do need to reduce that that and that's really just anecdotal reports and even within the week we find that if we stretch straight after a game and then for those next few days 
but then really reduce the static stretching towards the, you know, Saturday or Sunday game or whatever it is, again, we find that players are much, much more ready to go than if they've been doing lots of static stretching the night before in the morning of thinking that that's going to prime them and get them ready. So I believe there is something to it. I don't have any scientific support of it. So yeah, let's do it. Yeah, well, just anecdotally, John actually is a sprint coach. So he he coaches national and international level uh, athletes. And so um, I've also got, I did a three-year yoga apprenticeship. So implement a lot of that into uh, part of rehab and high performance with athletes we work with, but have seen that varied response firsthand where there seems to be certain types of profiles who don't respond as positively to that prolonged static stretching because you see that dampening effect of their, their neural output the following a few days. Yes, and, and I'll, just, I'll just add here because obviously what I've been doing for the last you know 20 minutes or so is advocating for the opposite of belief, and that's because people are so strong in their beliefs. I just want to show that there is a completely different argument fully backed up by science that says stretching can be good. You can do it in your warm up. You can do it prolonged. It can have, there are all these benefits from sympathetic drive to the fact that you can do it anywhere. But as I've already hinted, and as our own data show, it may not necessarily be the best way to get flexible, let alone an athlete who needs both mobility, which is sort of that active ability, and you know speed power and economy we don't we don't know enough about that and and as a former athlete i know that when i was playing rugby and stretching too much my legs felt like jelly and then i just had to reduce it and all of a sudden everything was working and i'd worked mm. with olympic sprinters i was a lead strength and conditioner for uk athletic for a while and worked with the english institute of sport and of course all those coaches were saying oh over in the us they don't do static stretching they just hold the muscle and then they let it go and all this it's around about being stiff and tight. And of course, there is an optimum, but it's been known for many, many years that there's something about not overstretching. There's something about having this stiffness that's good. This is probably what the resistance training is doing is it's stiffening as much as it's actually making you stronger or more powerful. And I would argue that this is why we think that these active mobility exercises. So remember, I've been ad advocating static stretching and saying dynamic stretching isn't, you know, somehow magical and it's not. But we do know that when you activate a muscle and stretch it, we get really good range of motion improvements. While you're doing it, you're teaching your body actively where it is in 3D space. You're teaching where its limbs are relative to its pelvis or relative to its shoulder girdle. You're activating the muscles, so you're probably not getting that real relaxation that would reduce sympathetic drive. And you can do it very, very quickly as part of any warm-up or anything else. So actually, I use a lot of mobility work and a lot of the best SNC coaches working with the top sides in the world from elite track and field coaches to the New Zealand All Blacks use a lot of this sort of active mobility work and find it really, really effective. Hmm. One thing actually I also wanted to ask about uh, stretching you mentioned it before is people who are more flexible uh, have a a better length tension relationship. You see that shift to the right where they can produce their peak force along the muscle lengths. But as you mentioned before, set stretching is most likely not going to create changes to muscle architecture. So what is the mechanism you think that causes that change in the, the muscle tendon behavior from stretching in terms of improving the or changing the length tension relationship? Yeah, good. I mean, this is a really good point. And again, let's go back to advocating for stretching. If you add stretching, <laughs> to a sprint program or a strength program, people tend to get stronger. If you're a big bench presser and you add static stretching, for some reason, you improve your 1RM bench press, right? So again, let's, let's, let's look at this great evidence. And you've just come up with another example. When you do a lot of static stretching, you actually shift your active length tension relationship to longer muscle lengths. So the, for those people who are advocating that, and that's why they do eccentrics, by the way, to get that, the best way to do it is actually to train at longer muscle lengths or through large length ranges is better than just doing eccentric per se. Um, but when we do static stretching or passive stretching, we often, not everyone, but we often see that. Now, I would argue that there are two potential mechanisms. One is that the parallel elastic component is becoming more compliant, and that's obviously working even in an active muscle condition. You know, we talked about active versus passive conditions. Mm. And what that's doing is allowing the muscle. So if, for, if the sarcomeres themselves are at, the, at a certain length and they're the same number, the whole muscle can still be slightly longer. And remember, it's also probably the case that as the fibers are stretched, they have to rotate. 
and there's a shear as they rotate. So if you've affected that parallel elastic component, if you've affected the extracellular matrix, they probably shear and rotate better and more easily. And th therefore what we might find if we ever get to do it is that the dynamic muscle function is observably different after doing passive stretching, even if we don't see any change at all in the just the resting architecture with no load in the muscle and hardly any pressure within the muscle mm -hmm. belly itself. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one reason. Of course, passive stretching <clears throat> also very strongly affects the afferent feedback. Probably what it's doing is affecting the way we re register and manipulate that feedback. Because for example, if I do lots of stretching and I, and I <clears throat> stimulate a nerve that can activate a muscle and then I look for a little reflex loop coming back from my spinal cord called the H reflex, we don't always see these decreases or changes in H reflexes. So it means that the actual info traveling around might be about the same, but how we perceive it is almost certainly different. How the spinal reflex circuitry is dealing with it and how our supraspinal structures are dealing with it is almost certainly different. And so it could be that by just stretching the muscle lots, <clears throat> we feel more able to produce force at longer muscle length. So we activate the muscles more effectively at those longer muscle lengths. And that change in activation will be seen as a shift now, remember, yeah. even acute static stretching. So if we go back to what I would call the poor design, no full warm up, not much going on, just compare dynamic and static stretching. Remember, in, in our 2016 review, I think that David Bain led at that point in time, static stretching was observed to increase force production at long muscle length by about 2.2%. And by the way, that's quite significant because if you stretch less than 60 seconds, the deficit in all studies combined was only 1%. So we're looking at, 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 at that at, if you do eccentric or you do forces at long length, we can actually increase acutely our force by doing stretching. And what you're showing there is that we can also increase our ability to do force at long muscle lengths with with um, stretch training. And I think that's got to do with the parallelistic component and or the way we perceive the stretch and therefore the way we're able to activate our muscles when we put them at longer lengths. You know, one thing that I think of through this discussion when we talk about things like muscle architecture, things that influence it, even stretching, is when you think about the um, trying to intellectually validate your own bias or opinion, we can always find or draw information be like, this is what's going on, this is what's happening. But it then makes me think, and I'm interested to hear your ideas like from when you're working more in the real world of coaching is, do we just need to look a bit more at a, a um, more broader perspective of going, okay, what are the requirements, the physical requirements for this particular task? What are the you know, deficits that you can identify and working on them? Because I feel like we could get, very easily get caught up in the weeds of they need to do more eccentrics or they need to do it at this muscle length and all these things to think about trying to create very unique physiological adaptations. Should we just be thinking at a more first principles perspective of do they, is their joint range of movement effective enough? Can they actually produce force in this particular direction and so on? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that, that's a really nice pragmatic approach. I mean, and, and again, this is why I ended up in biomechanics, right? I had to say, well, what are we actually trying to do here? How do we actually do a jump? Where, where's the power output coming from? You know, in, 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 if any of your listeners are in the clinical world doing rehabilitation, I mean, just walking. The biggest power output from walking comes from your ankle plantar flexors. Yet, if I go through all the clinical literature, looking at the use of strength training in all these clinical populations, they all say, hey, strength training doesn't really improve function in clinical populations, cerebral palsy or multiple sclerosis or whatever, but none of them actually train the ankle joint. <laughs> you know, so I go, well, if you didn't actually, if you're not trying to, if you don't understand how we're actually performing the task, if you don't then say, well, if I want this person to perform it in a certain way, and I now know that this is how it has to be done within some limits, where is it in this system now, in this human system, that there's a deficit that's going to be a problem? So where am I actually going to target? What am I trying to, what are the adaptations I'm trying to evoke? And then the, that, that way of looking at things, I think, is the best way to train anyone. You're a problem solver, right? What am I trying to get to? Where am I now? How do I get there? What I notice sometimes is people just have more basic stuff. Oh, if I just get you stronger and if I practice doing fast stuff, 
you should become a better 100 meter runner and a better tennis player and a better gymnast. And I sort of say, well, okay, generally, you're probably not going to do any damage, which is the first thing, of course. But if you really want to optimize performance, I think you've got to work backwards. And I think we'd had a chat or an email, you know, about how do we improve transfer? If we can transfer from the gym and I go, I've never talked about transfer. And it's for the reason you say, I'm not trying to get someone strong and then find out how to use the strength in the sporting arena. I'm trying to understand how they perform in the sporting arena and therefore how to optimize their body, how to build that human's body for the task that they're trying to do. What have you got now? Where are you trying to get to? And I think that's a really nice way of looking at what you're trying to do. And by the way, that's why I'm always looking at mechanisms because because then we do something and it doesn't work. We go, why not? Oh, it turns out that that's not actually happening anyway. We just never knew because we never looked. On that, you mentioned you know seeing the biomechanical task and then engineering the components around that. Do you have a specific process that you go through in order to identify which are the you know the bigger modulators in that in that process and saying okay these are the bigger rocks I need to attack these first because as you said it's almost in reverse to how most say strength and conditioning professionals would look at it they they would say oh let's build all of these physical capacities and then we'll work out later how this transfers to the biomechanical task um, but as you said that transfer is actually the difficult part when you're working in that direction. Um, for people who maybe haven't done it in the way that you're mentioning, where you start with the task and you go, okay, how do I amplify what they can do um, well and maybe minimize what they don't do well with, you know, building some of these components going yeah, well, you know, back towards Yeah, well, I mean, I'd say you've got other two ways training. of going about it. Yeah, two ways of going about it. I mean, in the end, if you if – you, if you, and by the way, physiologists do this. I mean, how many times do you say, well, what's more important there? Aerobic capacity? Is it mitochondrial density? Is it the anaerobic mm. capacity? You know, so they're just building their humans too. And they use sprint work versus long, slow work to try and build their optimum physiologist, physiology makeup, right? So it's, it should be no different for us in speed and power and strength. Um, and I would, I would argue that if you're in S&C and, and you really want to have your biggest influence, then I think you need to start going and looking at the biomechanics of the tasks that you're trying to improve. What's the knee joint actually doing here? What, what's the hip doing? Where, where are we storing and releasing elastic energy? You know, you've got your proximal muscles are big and the bigger their volume, the more power they can produce. But your distal muscles, they can't produce much power anyway. Um, they need to store and release elastic energy for power. I mean, you can only click your fingers because you're storing and releasing elastic energy. If you, if you take your thumb away and try and do that with just muscles alone, there's no, there's no click, right? If you can't even click your fingers by adding muscle work or muscle power, how are you going to jump high or sprint high? And then if you have distal muscles, which have these big, long tendons to get their power and you make them heavy, oh, you increase their inertia. That makes them harder to move. So if you think calf muscles are important because you read some biomechanics and said, right, now I know that in sprinting, the calf is really important. Sure. But it's the mechanics of how the muscle and the tendon work together to get that power. And if you get big calf muscles, you get a big inertia, your stride rate slows down. So now all of a sudden mass is critical. But this becomes a fun puzzle. How do I get huge power when I have to minimize my muscle mass as much as possible? And this is a really fun problem for a strength and conditioning expert. Now, if you don't have the biomechanical understandings, both at the whole body level, you know, where's the work being done, where's the power being produced, or at the tissue level, how does a muscle and a tendon actually work to do what it needs to do? What's the nervous system's job and how do I, what nervous system do I need? If you don't have that knowledge and understanding, then you need to maybe collaborate with people who do, whether that's a track and field coach or a biomechanist or someone else, get their input. And then your job can then be to figure out in the gym or on the track, how to maybe build some of those capacities most effectively. But in the end, I'd, I'd argue knowledge is key. And, and the, the more knowledge of, of the system you have, the better you're going to be able to, to make that translation possible. How much of it do you think is individualized? Do you think it's, you know, you should be working, and I'm sure this varies, but are you looking at the individual in front of you and saying, okay, this is a unique puzzle? Or do you think that there are lines of commonality that, you know, you can attack? Um, and 
I'm sure with your experience, you probably have examples of, you know, as you go higher up into uh, maybe sport, you tend to have to deal with more unique um, solutions to problems that you see because it becomes more, you know, finite in uh, the type of activity that someone can even carry out. Yeah. Um, th- th- so there's, it's a really good question and there's, there's no fine line there. So globally, if I ask you how to jog, and I want to know how to jog a bit better. Well, first of all, there's going to be practice at the motor task. The more I practice jogging, the more relaxed I will be. Now, we always have co-activation to stiffen the joint, but what your brain will learn is how to minimize it, how to optimize the timings, and you'll do better. So you've got specific task practice, and that's really cool. But what about from a strength or a conditioning point of view above just doing lots of running and different speeds of running? Well, we know that the biggest power output in jogging is at the car, at the ankle joint, and we know that the plantar surface of the foot and the Achilles tendon themselves are storing and releasing more than half of all the energy for running. We know that muscles lose a lot of energy. They're only about 20 to 25% efficient. So they're just gonna produce a lot of heat and get rid of it. So what we really want is energy storage in the elastic tendon. So then you do a lot of reading and you find out that actually turns out that if you can switch your muscles on a little bit quicker, that process of storing uh, energy is a little bit more effective and efficient. If you can handle the loading better. And both of those come from things like plyometrics training. So you say, okay, well, I could add a little bit of plyos to my distance runner. And now my system, my nervous system and my muscle tendon systems might be more capable of the running. So now if they keep doing all that running, they might run better. The current evidence is that is correct. You add plyometric training to an already existing running program and even high level olympic athletes improve economy or performance 5000 meter running time for example but then you go okay but there's evidence and both modeling and and empirical that having slightly higher than average slightly higher than you and i in tendon stiffness might be effective well we get that from heavyweight training so is it true then that if i give some heavyweight training to distance runners they improve The answer is yes. If we take international distance runners and middle distance runners and we give them very low volume but high intensity heavy strength training, particularly if it's got something to do with the calf, could be quarter squats, could be specific calf, and then we measure their running economy, particularly at higher speeds, 16 kilometers an hour and above, running economy improves. Well, that fits the theory that if I adapt the tissue a bit, they're going to improve running in addition to just doing lots of running. So what we generally then know is if you're a distance runner, you could add a little bit of heavyweight training and a little bit of plyos, and you should improve your performance. And then as an individual, you can manipulate how much you do. And at some point, you get a bit too tired or you you feel like it's not doing you any extra benefits. So you might as well just focus on running. Other people say, oh, it hasn't done anything yet. Maybe I just need to go a bit heavier and a bit more. And then you optimize it. So in a general sense, I think there are some really nice frameworks now within which we can work and that understanding general concepts of how we move and how training can affect how we move are really useful. But I have to say, once you you get down to the individual, I mean, I've seen, you know, high level athletes who really have poor running techniques that they their hips are moving in ways they shouldn't be, their inability to actually maintain appropriate body position, they're not using arms effectively, they're not... And so at the individual level, you have to go to each individual and say, right, what are the bits we think they're getting right versus not quite right? And then you have to ask whether you just change some coaching cues or whether, as an SNC expert, your job is to slightly change their body. That if you can improve strength or something at a particular joint or structure, will they then self-select the more optimum movement pattern? Remember, Humans move by simply um, finding a solution to the problem. If they have a certain body, they will find or try to find the optimum solution for them. So very often, if you're trying to change a technique, the first thing to do is change their body. If they are uh, accelerating out of the blocks in 100 meters and they stand up too quickly, do you just keep cueing them to stand over? Or is it that they have a real lack of ability in that really acute hip position to maintain appropriate neutral spine while loading massively in an acute angle at the hip well maybe i need to go into the gym and do one-legged leg presses one-legged front hack squats and other things that we've been doing for decades and all of a sudden their brain is really really comfortable in that position at that acute hip angle 
And within three weeks, they're blowing out of the blocks because they can actually adopt the right body position. So as a strength and conditioner, you've then affected technique to optimize that individual human. And I think that's where working with the coaches and the strength and conditioning experts together is really good. I mean, if you're S&C and you only ever see your athletes in the gym, I'm not really sure how you can optimize their program at all. If you're not chatting to the coach and watching the move, um, maybe maybe you're missing a few things. So it's worth going and having a look. You know, one thing, um, one question I wanted to ask you is probably more of a philosophical question because some of the discussions we've had, some of the um, your responses are almost quite controversial, go against sort of conventional wisdom. And I, was, I was interested just to think about what's actually allowed you to think, formulate your own opinions? Because I feel like we often get indoctrinated into certain ways of, of believing certain things and it can be quite hard to actually change that. Um, uh, maybe it's a fear of failure uh, that I've had since I was a little kid. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. Um, I like knowing stuff and I really, really, really want to know anything. All right. If, if, if you're a, an athlete or a coach, I would love to be someone that you can ask me anything and I'll tell you the answer. The problem with that is we are almost, we are so often wrong. I mean, if you think about what we knew 20 years ago, it's, it is very different from what we know today. Yet 20 years ago, we had phenomenal science and, and decades of sports science research. What that probably means is that if I want to be right and I need to know the answer, I have to come at it from the point of view that right now I could literally be wrong. And if I'm wrong right now, I need to be the first person to figure out that it's, that it's wrong and figure out what might be right. And I have been wrong. And therefore, all I can do is think to myself, what could I be missing? Let's go back to the pragmatic approach. How do we move? What do we know about it? And what do we know about how we do it? And every time I think of something new, I go, does this tick all of the boxes from what we know from a mechanism point of view, from what I've seen in elite sport to what I feel as a biased human? And of course, I end up finding out that, yeah, lots of things weren't the way they seem. And by the way, you know, we say, yeah, I, yeah. and we can go on about PAP. We can go on. There's lots of areas that I go, I can't believe people think these things. But, <laughs> but, but I guess the other thing is in the end, I was very lucky that I, in my early days, I had a lot of great conversations with um, animal researchers, veterinary researchers, who were studying how a cheetah runs or how a bird flies. And then to understand how they did that opened my eyes to actually how humans move. And once you kind of get the fundamentals of how we move at the, the real tissue and nervous system level, you start to realize that if I really know that level of detail, then I can see the congruence between that infinite detail and the big applied outcomes we see on the sporting field or the pitch or the whatever. And it's only when I have both of those are reconciling that I feel comfortable. And whenever one of them seems discrepant, I feel very uneasy. And when people ask me a question, I'm not confident in my answer. And I, I just hate that. I hate not being confident. I can sound, I can lie to you all I like. Nature doesn't care what I think, right? So I'm going to be wrong if I just tell you I'm right. So, yeah, it just means that I then read as much as I can and I and I, you start to realize that we were putting jigsaws together with the wrong parts. And, and if I ask a comparative biologist and I say, hey, we really think that eccentric training is adding all these sarcomeres and series, my comparative biology friends ask, why would I even consider that to be reasonable? You know, why, why would a muscle want to do that? Uh, why would it shift its properties? Then you can't walk up a stair because you did a few Nordics. And I go, oh, yeah, good point. You know, so in sports science, it might seem controversial, but that doesn't mean that in other areas of science, it's controversial at all. Well, it, the reason I think even Jack's asking you is you seem very comfortable, and I don't know if it's something you think about, maybe it happens naturally, being skeptical and a contrarian and being able to stand up there and, as you said, say, well, I think that I know this, but I don't know that, or maybe we're wrong about this, whereas other people seem to shy away from that confrontation. Is that something that you think about and you think, okay, it's important for me as someone who's been in the industry for a while, who does have some very strong credibility to stand on this hill and, and, and be willing to show, I know this, but I don't know this. And we, we collectively don't know this. So don't make those claims or is it, that's just natural and it happens and you kind of just deal with the consequences afterwards. <laughs> yeah, a bit of both. Look, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from and I can't speak for anyone else. I can't, I can't mm. explain why when people 
well, in the end, we all have a, you've heard of cognitive dissonance, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that if, if our interpretation differs from others, it causes us so much stress. You see this in politics, you see it in sports science, you see it in nutrition, you see it everywhere. That if we, and if, and if lots of people tell us something and it makes sense to us and experts say it, we believe it. Then once you start telling other people that, I mean, imagine if you were lying to them all along. I mean, that's really tough for a human to deal with. Maybe, maybe one of the things is, is that I feel more stress and I feel more anxious about these discrepancies that I talked about or that I might be telling anything that might be wrong. And, and something I've told you today, I'm sure will be wrong. That's why I always go, I don't know about this and I'm not sure about that. Um, and maybe that stress is more than the stress of me fitting into everyone else's or the, the common belief. It, I, I admit that I'm not too stressed about having a different belief or opinion. It's more that I'm super excited about maybe showing people that there's a, there's a potentially different solution to this problem. And if we get this thing right, that maybe we could do some really remarkable things. And in the end, I just want to do remarkable things, right? I'd, I'd love to get a sprint runner running nine five. How do I do it? Well, if I do <laughs> what I do now, I won't, right? You don't win an Olympic gold jump. medal for doing what everyone did the last Olympics. You win a gold medal for, yeah. for knowing what's going to come 10 years down the track. So if you're not thinking 10 years away, uh, yeah, look, well, I, I can't answer your uh, question, but that's... No, no, that's it's funny you said that because I think you actually hit on... Like, I've thought about this a lot, but uh, weirdly... But I think it comes down to the people who have a very strong value for the truth tend to protect that more so than the uh, interaction they have or with the other people who maybe disagree with them. So they're less worried about the discomfort that they feel for someone disagreeing with them because to them, as you said, that that feeling that you get by actually holding to your value, which is the seeking of truth and knowledge, is much more valuable to you than what someone thinks about you know, whether you're right or wrong. Um, yeah. and it's, it's yeah. important for you to reconcile that personally. So you're, you're willing to die on that hill because at least, you know, that you're holding to that value that you've got. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I care what people think of me. I'm human and I probably care too much, yeah, we all but do. what people think of me isn't what I think about a specific scientific theory or a way to train an athlete. What they think of me is me as a human, right? And then that other stuff is an intellectual pursuit and I love the intellectual pursuit and I get super excited by that intellectual pursuit. So you know, I, I don't care who's right and wrong. I just want to know the right stuff. So it makes it easy, you know, to, mm. to sort of disagree with it in that sense. Yeah. I also think too, when you observe people who don't show that humility, you often think, I don't want to be reflect. I don't want to be uh, reflecting that type of behavior myself. Yeah, maybe, maybe. And by <laughs> the way, I'll tell you guys, I have asked some really stupid questions to some really intelligent people in my time. I think that's, the other thing I try and tell my students, because, you know, they say, well, you know, obviously those of us who've been around for longer know more stuff, right? So when you're young, everyone seems so much more knowledgeable. And I say, well, yeah, of course I am. I'm just old, right? But at the same time, I've asked Roger Anoka or Pierre Agard or, I mean, you name a high profile researcher and you can, I can pretty much tell you the conference where I asked something really, really fundamental. And it might have been fundamental because I knew it, but I just wasn't sure and I needed to confirm it. Do you think I've, I've noticed actually... that a lot? I've noticed that a lot with people like yourself who are extreme. I think, you, you know, if you did a study on someone's inquisitiveness, like you'd score off the charts. I've noticed that a lot with those people that they are really okay with asking those very basic questions. And it's often because there is that moment where you realize that maybe someone actually hasn't answered this and it's taken for granted that this knowledge is actually acceptable. It's like or what just you made assumptions. Yeah, there's assumptions made. It's like what you were mentioning like very early on when you were saying how people just took verbatim that, oh, dynamic is better. And it's like, well, based on what? Where did that come from? Um, we all just adopted it, as you said, even maybe when there was no evidence to start with and then we readopted it 30 or 40 years later. Um, and then someone comes along like yourself and says, wait a minute, where's the evidence for this? Um, and on the surface, it seems like that's a dumb question because we've been doing it for 30 or 40 years, but those inquisitive people are the ones who actually go and on behalf of everyone else, but mostly just because they're interested, they go, well, no, I'm going to ask that question. And then it actually opens up often a discussion that people go, well, yeah, I, I never know where that, that assumption came from. I was interested in that too, but I'd never thought of it in that way. 
Yeah, you're right. And it takes guts. And I do care what people think of me. And I, you know, it is hard to ask those questions, but you just, you just want to know the answer. And if you don't know the basics, it's really hard to then think of something in, you can't even assumptions on top of it. Exactly. If, you, if you don't know what the foundation is. That's it. I, I mean, I literally had a, a meeting last week with a Canadian researcher who knows far more about muscle because she does a lot of the modeling work. And and I said, a few things have been troubling me for a few years. Can I run a few things past you? These are fundamental things. I'm very sure I'm just completely wrong and you'll be able to tell me. And for three of the three of the four things, it, the answer was, I'd never thought about it like that. That yeah. is so true. You know, like we say short fibers should be stiff and economical, but if the muscle has lots of them in a row, doesn't that still make it expensive? Hang on, this doesn't make sense. So now we want to, in the next couple of years, do a whole bunch of modeling and try and figure out, actually, are we right around how architecture predicts function? Are we Have we got this right? Because at the moment, some of the th fundamental things don't add up, but they came from an unease. And as I tried to explain these things to myself and to other people, I just felt like I wasn't quite the truth. And when I sat down and really went into it, I realized that there was something completely wrong. Now, either that means I'm wrong, which case I better ask someone because I don't want to be wrong, or we're all wrong, in which case we'd better do the research so we can it. prove that we were all yeah. wrong. It doesn't matter who's wrong. I'm happy to be wrong. <laughs> if I'm wrong, I'll know the right answer tomorrow. That's easy. If I'm right, then it's going to be years before we know the right answer, and that's the yeah. worst thing. So I'd rather just be wrong. Uh, we've been going a while, so we usually ask a question right at the end, which is uh, – Often people answer it, uh, and, and I get the, the idea that maybe you won't answer it this way, but most, most people answer it in relation to their work, especially if they're researchers. But as an inquisitive person, I like asking, and Jack got, as, does as well, what's something that you're actually exploring that you're really interested in that's a bit of a, you know, a worm in your brain that you can't mm -hmm. get out that is probably not necessarily related to your work, but is something that you're just like, oh, I'm really interested in learning. It might be you know, as a dumb example, something to do with politics or, you know, economics or something that you're just like, actually, that's taken some of my interest and, and, and I'm actually exploring this. <laughs> that's a good question and a really hard one for, for me because you may get the impression that I don't, I don't really stop thinking about lots of things and I think quite quickly about lots of stuff. So <laughs> my life is riddled with these things. I'll, I'll give you three examples. One is I really want to learn how to do um, better science communication stuff. So what is it? How do I even edit videos? How do I do all that? I'm actually really interested in the audiovisual. I love the creative side of it. I'll never be a podcaster. I'll leave that to experts like you. But I, I've, I've been really starting to want to get into and I've been sort of Googling around trying to look at the best way to edit videos or draw cartoons. Or I feel, do I feel like you have you, you would have the ability to run a one-person podcast, Andrew Huberman style, just explaining <laughs> muscle physiology and biomechanics and people would actually love it. So maybe you should contact him and ask him because he, he's done something like yourself. He's a researcher, obviously, in neuroscience, but he kind of just did a one-man show. And I, I think given how much... It seems like you enjoy talking about these topics. I think you could probably pull it off pretty easily. Yeah, if I talk enough, yeah, you remember. <laughs> I'll tell you the second no, one. The second one. Yeah, the second one that I really enjoyed for the last year or two is trying to understand Einstein's theories of relativity and how they marry up with Newton's laws of motion. Because obviously we teach Newton's laws, but they're not right. They're only right in a very specific subtext. Approximation, yeah. Here on Earth, yeah, when gravity is low and speeds are slow. It all boils down to those little equations, but everywhere else in the world. So, you know, how does a ball curve in space according to um, Einstein's theories, you know, and and things like it turns out that it's not the curvature of space that makes it, it's the curvature of time that makes the ball looks like it changes course in space. I mean, these sorts of things are just absolutely remarkable because the time difference between one meter above the earth and at the earth is so infinitesimally small, but it turns out that when you have to put two things on the same axes and you have to convert time into a distance, you're multiplying by the speed of light, all of a sudden, this much time distance difference makes a big distance difference. And so a ball mm. looks like it curves because of the curvature of time. I mean, that's pretty ridiculous, that's, isn't it? That's remarkable, isn't it? So that, well, that, that type of stuff was fun, and I've still got a bit more reading to do on that one. Um, third one, it, well, you mentioned politics, and that's the one for me, because I get really frustrated that we're not funding nurses and doctors and um, you know, social workers and a lot of people, <laughs> academics, teachers, and uh, we keep getting told by federal governments that it all costs money. And it occurred to me by looking at lots of different videos and reading for the last few years that if, as long as the money stays within the country and as long as people don't hoard it, and remember, 
wealthier people are more likely to hoard because they're trying to they, they're able to make wealth whereas poorer people can't hoard they have to spend and if you give them money that they will spend it on something because they haven't got as much so if you give more money if you give more money to jobs where does that money go does it really go into a debt and the answer is no and i've had to check this with a lot of economists because again i had to ask the dumb question <laughs> hey it looks like we all pay income tax and then we pay property taxes and company taxes and payroll taxes so if we're just spending all that government money within the system doesn't it all end up back at the government at some point point? <clears throat> and the answer is yes within a few years it does in other words Governments don't have to run their, well, federal governments. In Australia, state governments, unfortunately, are really hamstrung. But federal governments apparently don't have to run like a household budget. If they put an extra 10, 20% nurses on and paid them money, eventually that money would come back and it actually wouldn't cost anything. That doesn't mean we can pay us all a million dollars. That's got lots of problems with inflation and lots. It's more complicated than that. But that was really interesting to me, how the economy works and the mathematics of the economy was really cool. And I wish we all knew more about that. We might make different political decisions. <laughs> Tony, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Uh, we really do appreciate having world-renowned experts like yourself willing to give up so generously their time uh, because there's a couple of blokes like us who don't know much trying to learn from <laughs> people like yourself. So thank you very much. Uh, look, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's been a, a, sorry for a few long answers there. They're pretty complicated. That's great. Questions you decided to throw my way. So well done you. And uh, it was great to finally chat. I know we've been wanting to do this for a while. So I'm really, really glad we got it done. And thanks very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Cheers then, guys. Good luck.